so I'm going to be switching uh, over. That's fair. I was just going to say about uh, Twitter, the only thing is I only, I, I started um, using it about a year ago and uh, let me just mute this. Ah, it, it always, it's, the YouTube starts playing on my um, screen and then we get a feedback thing because you can hear it. Anyway, um, yeah, so it, it turns out that people on science Twitter are really nice. And uh, it's it's surprisingly easy to connect with with people, and I was I was really pleasantly surprised at how you know people just want to talk about about their science. So if you do want to give it a try, it's easier than I thought. I was like freaked out about it. I am also an old millennial, and then I was like, okay, I'll just try. And then yeah, I mean, it was like, good. the best I do is retweet stuff. Look at your pussy cat. I just lost mine. Um, I don't want to cry. Um, like yeah uh, we can talk about that later I did too actually a different cat yeah. and yeah. yeah I had him for like from postdoc to now so I had him for 11 years so it's it's cute to see it reminds me yeah this is my my buddy Melvin he's uh, hi Melvin <laughs> <laughs> I think uh because my voice is a little you know high he um he thinks I'm upset sometimes when I'm talking I'm just regular talking like this is just how I sound but he he's, comes and he tries to comfort me, like, with his body. So. So, I'm saying they're, they're so useful. So mine, he would come and he tried to participate in Zoom. You mm-hmm. know? Yes. What people right. call in to speak to him. And then he would come, make an appearance, and then leave. <laughs> but they were, really. I mean, they didn't really want to talk to you. They definitely I'm wanted like, to talk to you. I was like, um, dude, they're not calling for you. <laughs> Well, it took me a while to get someone else because I've had him for 11 years. So it's, it's, it was, it, it still is tough. But I'm um, glad to see Melvin. Look at Melvin. <laughs> yes. He's, he's, uh, say hi to your, your adoring fans. No, he's not. I know, right? He's like, <laughs> um, I, I do recommend it's really hard to, um, to sort of like, it's not really moving on, but to, to get a second pet after you yeah. lose one. But, you know, I think, the heart has a lot of room and you, you know, so I still have find a, love again <laughs> in my, well, I have a street dog that my, I, I adopted that my mother is taking care of in Trinidad. Right. And she's complaining because now the dog is in the house watching TV and she's uh, like, I end up with a stray dog that's now in my house watching TV. You but know, it's so. still your dog, even though your mom's taking care. I think that, you know, what? <laughs> she complains it's her dog now. Mm hmm. I think it's her dog too. I mean, especially, I mean, it's not that close by, so. Exactly. Yeah, the fact that she's letting the dog stay inside to watch TV, (laughs) I think that's just an excuse. (laughs) That's really cute. That's very, very cute. Um, I just, uh, for everyone who's here, we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Um, If anyone else wants to participate in the pet talk, feel free to jump in. Very important stuff. We did a poll on here uh, a little while ago, and we found out that there were actually a lot more dog people than cat people amongst this community, which I was surprised I'm, and disappointed I, yeah. about. I just want to apologize because I am very angry about that result still. Um, Thanks, Becky. I don't think it represents the scientific community at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. Most scientists I know have, I mean, they can have both, but they usually have at least a cat, you know? And usually cat comes with them from like either grad school or, or so forth. So the cat is like part of the academic journey. It's like, you know, I, but at least for me, let me speak for myself. Yeah, it's certainly easier in terms of like lab time, right? You can spend a 12 hour day in lab. Yeah, yeah and you, you can get away with that. Anyway, all right, Adam, uh, do you wanna? No, that was, that was a great way to begin the stream on YouTube, <laughs> all this cat talk. Okay, uh, hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. Um, we've got two speakers today, so I'll crack straight on. Um, same thing as normal, which is if you have questions, you can pop them in the chat. And if you want to ask yourself, just write the word question. Um, okay, so our first speaker is Emmanuel Dornier. Emmanuel did his PhD in Eric Rubinstein's lab, uh, and then a postdoc in Jim Norman's lab at the Beetson Institute. And he's now a postdoc in Fanny Jolin's lab at uh, Gustave Roussy Institute in Paris. And he's going to be talking about um, his observations of a new mode of migration undertaken by colorectal cancer cells that was recently put on bioarchive. So go ahead, Emmanuel. Thanks, Adam. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Okay, everyone can see this? Yep, we can see it. Thanks. <laughs> 
Oops, sorry. So yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, so today I'm I'm going to show you I'm going to share with you some some of the works I've been doing um, since I joined uh, the Fanny Jolin's lab at the Gustave Roussy Institute uh, near Paris. And uh, if you if you want to have a to have a chat afterwards, uh, my Twitter handle is here, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions or, or any other discussion that you you might want to do. So today we are going to, going to talk, uh, as Adam say, about um, our latest. Um, results showing a new mode of collective uh, of migration in colorectal cancer. So in the Fanny, uh, in Fanny's lab, we have um, <clears throat> a kind of a, an original approach we call, which we call translational cell biology, whereby we, we leverage the, um, the fact that we have the Gustav Roussy hospital just next door to us. And so we have very easy access to cancer patients and, and we have a nice long lasting collaboration with the digestive cancer unit, in, in particular surgeons where when you have cancer, patient, cancer patients undergoing surgery, we can have um, easy access to live primary cancer specimens that we, we can bring in the lab uh, as explants um, that we can propagate into 3D ECM gels. And uh, doing this, we are able to, to um, establish biological collections uh, in the forms of organoid or, or patient-derived xenografts. And uh, PDX is uh, in particular are a very useful tool because we've shown uh, in a previous paper that uh, by keeping the, the primary specimens in, as, as PDX is in vivo, you, you, keep their, uh, you keep them closest to what they were in, in the human patient. So it's a very useful tool to, uh, to keep on studying the, um, this material. And so this uh, workflow is very useful for us to generate and validate hypotheses that then we can then turn in, in generating biomarker therapeutic targets and any kind of valuable to, to translate back to, to cancer patients. And so basically that's, that's, the, that's what we did for, for our first study where we used um, a cohort of HD cancer, colorectal cancer patients. So they all had advanced metastatic disease. We didn't discriminate for the histological or molecular subtypes. And the question we really wanted to ask is when you have a patient that presents with a primary tumor that has spread to secondary sites in the peritoneal space, can you find some cancer intermediates in the peritoneal space? So in the effusions. <clears throat> And so uh, to answer this question, uh, we took effusions from these, these 50 cancer patients. And indeed, we were able to find cancer material in, in, in the patients, and in particular, when they were of mucinous subtype. So the mucinous subtype is one of the most uh, aggressive uh, subtypes you can have in, in colorectal cancer. Sorry, my dog's acting out. Um, okay. And so what we found is that um, the presence of this cancer material was always associated with peritoneal carcinomatosis and um, a much worse prognosis for the patient. And when we had a closer look at these um, intermediates, uh, what we found is that um, there were rather clusters of a few of 100 cells rather than single cells, and they presented with this um, atypical inverted polarity, as you can see exemplified with the esbrin staining. And we also found macrovilli at the surface of these clusters and a full array of cell-cell junctions, uh, indicating that they were very uh, differentiated and polarized uh, cancer cells. <clears throat> and what was very striking as well is that this inverted polarity was kept when uh, you, uh, you were looking at these um, clusters in, in the stroma of the primary tumor, but also on, in the metastatic sites. So because of this inverted polarity, we call these uh, structures SIPs, or tumosphere with uh, inverted polarity. And so we wanted to test if this uh, particular architecture was needed for their, um, their ability to establish metastasis. So to do this experiment, we either keep, kept SIPs as collectives or um, dissociated them as, as single cells and then did an intraperitoneal injection into mice. And then we follow their ability to establish metastasis and, and we found that um, when SIPs were kept in clusters, they were much, much more efficient in establishing metastasis than when they were as single cells. And when we look at the architecture of the metastases that were uh, established, what we could find is that again, here it's exemplified with the um, apical marker Esrin, you could still see this uh, inverted polarity in presence of, uh, of matrix. So in this first part, we, uh, we showed you that we were able to find a new metastatic intermediate in, in the peritoneal effusions of, uh, of metastatic colorectal patients that uh, consist of clusters of a few hundred cells um, that are very efficient uh, initiator of metastasis uh, and present this uh, atypical inverted polarity. 
What we also noticed is that these tips, they can invade using an unconventional mode of collective uh, locomotion. And what we mean by this is that if you um, look at the only mode of collective invasion that has been described so far, it's, um, it kind of splits the, the collective into two cohorts, the follower cells and then the lead cells. And the leader cells have this particular uh, protrusive morphology and they, they use a traction-based uh, migration to, uh, to pull the cohort forward. And when we looked at our tips in, in peritoneal membranes, uh, we could uh, never find any evidence of these uh, protrusive cells. They always had like nice round uh, smooth edges. And when we looked at the migration in 3D ECM gels, so collagen or, or matrix gel, again, they were very smooth looking with no apparent um, <clears throat> protrusive leader cells. And if we go back to single cell invasion, really single cells can use two types of uh, migration. On one end of the spectrum, you have a more mesenchymal type of migration, which is similar to what I've just described for, for collective invasion, where you have the front of the cell exerting traction on, on the extracellular matrix. But you have another mode, which is the amoeboid movement, where you have, um, on this mode of migration, it, uh, the cell rely on their the contractility of the actomyosin uh, cytoskeleton. So you have a very contractile rear that allows this sort of propulsive um, migration. And importantly, this mode of migration is independent of uh, the interaction with the extracellular matrix. And when we looked at the um, <clears throat> histology of some of our cancer patients, we could find evidence of emboles into um, lymphatic vessels. And you have one example here with an HNE stain here, and then uh, an intervene beta-1 stain to show you that, um, so here you have a bit, little zoom, don't know why the box is gone. So it shows you that the uh, intervene beta-1, which is a basolateral marker, is indeed excluded from the apical border. So showing that this uh, rather big cluster is also polarized, but it's present within. So it's able to spread through an environment that is devoid of ECM. So to us, this lack of protrusive leader cells in this uh, features that really resemble um, what happens in amoeboid single cell migration um, really made us ask the question, is there a collective amoeboid mode of migration? And so to answer this question, um, we, turned, we needed a, a basically a, um, an experimental model. And we turned to uh, some of our collaborators in the, at the, PL, uh, in the PL lab. And um, so they've shown recently in, uh, in 2015 that if you take a cell that is using more a mesenchymal type of migration, so traction based, you can switch it to an amoeboid mode of migration if you confine this cell uh, into a non-adhesive environment. So really confinement and uh, non-adhesiveness are two pillars that foster amoeboid migration. So we thought we could design some microfluidic devices to adapt what the, the PL lab was using for single cells, but adapt it to the size of a cluster, which is obviously bigger than a single cell. And we landed on these metrics, which are 60 micrometer wide and 30 micrometer tall. And uh, we generated these um, series of channels <clears throat> that we can coat uh, with anything we want, really. So um, in the, the study I'm going to show you, we chose to use a uh, collagen one if we want to have a sort of sticky ECM-like environment, or use a polyethylene glycol or PEG, which is a, a non-adhesive polymer that allows you to uh, produce a, a non-adhesive environment. And so the first question we really wanted to ask is what happens if you put the, our clusters from, uh, from patients? Are they able to migrate in these conditions? So what we found is that indeed, um, if, so here you have an example for two different patients. So a cell line is isolated for two different patients. And they are both able to migrate into these uh, non-adhesive uh, environment. <clears throat> but this was not uh, restricted to these cancer patient samples, as we could find uh, can colorectal cancer cell lines that were also able to migrate uh, in non adhesive uh, conditions. So here you have the example for the MTX HT29 uh, colorectal cancer cell. And uh, you have the quantification here. And as I told you before, um, one of the pillars of the, this mesenchymal type of collective invasion, which is the only type of, of collective migration described so far, is uh, that it relies on the interaction with the matrix. And they do this normally by uh, establishing focal adhesions. So we wanted to see what happens if you, if you, um, if you coat our uh, micro devices with uh, an ECM protein like collagen one. And what we found is that um, 
the presence of collagen greatly decreased the ability of, of our clusters to migrate into our um, micro devices. And because we can't really do uh, immunofluorescence uh, just yet in our system, um, we rely on the expression of fluorescent uh, proteins or probes to, to study what happens. And um, to look at the formation of focal adhesions, I generated clusters which stably express uh, paxilin tagged with m turquoise, and you can see it here. So when you put these clusters in a micro devices that have been coated with collagen one, you can uh, see the, the establishment of nice mature focal adhesions. So bear in mind, this is not one cell, it's a collection of about 20 to 30 cells uh, at the bottom. And perhaps not surprisingly, what you could find is that in not adhesive conditions, um, there was no establishment of, uh, of uh, focal adhesions. And here you have the quantification. Um, so one of the, the, the key features of amoeba in migration, as I described previously for single cell, is the, um, is the ability to establish a gradient of contractility. And uh, you have this increased contracti myosin contractility at the back, which allows this propulsive uh, mode of migration. So to study the, what happens in our system, I expressed um, the myosin light chain tagged with m turquoise in our clusters. To, uh, so to visualize where uh, myosin activation occur occurs. And then we looked at um, clusters which uh, do not migrate or clusters that migrate. And as you can see on these videos, when the cluster is static, you have a rather homogeneous cluster um, cortex of myosin and an even distribution along the, along the cluster. Whereas when you have a migrating cluster, you have a very strong accumulation of myosin towards the back. And, uh, and, um, cluster moves. So it's, here you have our quantification, where we looked at the uh, rear accumulation of myosin. And you can see that in a, when you have a cluster that migrates, uh, you have a clear accumulation of um, myosin uh, at the back of the cluster. And perhaps not surprisingly, if you tamper with myosin activity, uh, you will oppose the, uh, the ability of clusters to, to do a collective amoeba in migration, as you can see here with this example of blebistatin. And here you have the quantification for the patient sample and uh, for the cell line. And um, we found that also ROC uh, inhibition uh, using Y27 compound was able to oppose um, <clears throat> collective amoeba in migration, suggesting that Roway might be implicated. And um, so to test this, we turn to our collaborator in the Copé Lab. And uh, this is the work of uh, the, uh, one of their PhD students, Jean. Uh, so what he did was uh, we created uh, clusters which either express the uh, control uh, construct. So what he's doing is optogenetics. And um, so with this um, row A construct, what you can do is um, upon illumination with blue light, you can direct very and especially restrict where you have row A activation. So you can really uh, look at uh, the consequences of row A activation in a subset of cells within your cluster. And so in this control conditions, you have this cluster migrating from right to left and illuminates the, the front of the cluster and it just doesn't care, keeps on moving towards the left. Whereas here in the opto rowway condition, you have a cluster migrating towards the left, illuminates the front, and then the cluster changes direction uh, upon illumination. So here you have the quantification of this uh, scenario where you have a cluster migrating from, from right uh, to left, and uh, we eliminate the front, activating row A in the, the subset of cells uh, at the front. And suddenly these front cells become rear cells. And you have here the quantification of the, of the migration switch that happens when you have row A activation. And here, uh, as a comparison, what happens in the control. So upon blue light illumination, they just keep on going uh, as this cluster. And the other thing we wanted to try was to further characterize the role of row A in this um, a migration and see if when you have a, a cluster that migrates, that already migrates, if you uh, suractivate, increase the activation of row A by eliminating the back cells, okay, are you able to increase the speed? And uh, it turns out that the um, <clears throat> row A is not the accelerator. So if you have, if you further uh, activate row A in the, at the back of a cluster that is already moving, nothing really happens, you have the same speed. So really what we think is that row A is uh, critical in uh, 
determining where is the back and uh, determining the um, direction of migration. So now what was the role of the rear contractility? And uh, as I told you before, uh, this is quite critical for ambiguine migration. And um, so this is uh, a figure from Adam's paper uh, in science uh, from the Meyer lab. And what he did was look at neural crest cell, uh, the crest cell model. Well, they do collect the typical collective migration where you have um, protrusive uh, leader cells and a cohort of follower cells. And what Adam could, uh, could show is that uh, similarly to what we observe in our system, we had a nice actin ring all around this cluster, which was very uh, enriched at the back. And this gradient of contractility, um, he found that it generates um, cell movement that is responsible for the, for the cohort of uh, moving forward. So we wanted to test this in our system. And uh, <clears throat> in order to do this, we uh, generated clusters which express uh, an histone H2B uh, tagged with M-cherry. This allows us to track individual uh, nuclei, so individual cells. And so we looked at what happens uh, when a cluster is migrating, uh, again, in non-adhesive conditions. And uh, as you can see here with the individual tracking of nuclei, I hope you can appreciate that it's uh, a very much a straight line and there's very little neighbor exchange between cells. And uh, it looks like a, a complete translation with not, no obvious cell movements as uh, Adam could observe in the request. And so to quantify this, we did it with Raphael Wauturier. And uh, so what they did with, uh, with Jan-Law was to um, determine three different areas in the cluster, the side, the center, and uh, the other side. And um, if the cell movements are generating movement as a, in the neural crest model, uh, you should have a negative speed on the sides. So you should have the, the cells going backwards on the, on, you should have lateral cell movement. And what we observe when we uh, tracked the individual cells in these uh, quadrants, we, the three different ones had similar speed, which was the same speed as the cluster. So none of these had a negative speed, meaning going against uh, the cluster's direction of migration. So this to us indicated that it's purely translation and there's no cell movement that is um, supporting the cluster's migration. So then the, the other hypothesis was that this gradient of contractility would obviously support a retrograde flow of uh, actin or myosin. And um, so we went back to looking at uh, the cortex of our clusters. So here you have a cluster expressing the myosin light chain uh, tagged with turquoise again. And this was some particle imaging velocimetry done by uh, Emily in our lab. And what you could show is that, so you have a very short video, it's about an hour. So the, the clusters move about 10 micron. But uh, in this time frame, we could still see um, some movement of, of myosin, some retrograde flow of myosin along the cortex. And here you have a temporal average of the, the PIV maps. So it's coded by amplitude. So the, the hotter the temperature, the, the more movement you have. And you can clearly appreciate that there's a strong retrograde uh, myosin fluxes at the cortex of the, of the clusters. So this is what we could see when we were imaging the basically the middle section of our clusters. And um, one of, the, of our earliest hypotheses was that um, most of the fluxes would be at the glass uh, interface where you have uh, a lot of interaction with the substrate. So we thought that the cluster would generate a lot of flux here in order to move forward. And we looked really, really hard for very long, but we couldn't find any coordinated uh, fluxes either for actin or for myosin. And so we think that, um, uh, well, the only thing I would that we could clearly see was that with these, lo with these local uh, myosin retrograde fluxes that would associate with, with cluster migration. So in conclusion, uh, in the first bit of the talk, I showed you um, that we were able to, um, to identify new, a new metastatic intermediate in, uh, in colorectal cancer that can invade um, in the form of clusters, so in form of collectives and um, that they are um, using a new mode of collective invasion that is, is, is not like the one that's been described uh, so far. And we think that we uh, close the parallel with single cell invasion where we found uh, the equivalent of uh, collective invasion uh, that we call collective amyloid migration. And this mode of migration is really independent of the formation of focal adhesions 
and it rather relies on the on the polarization of the actomyosin um, network. So it forms like a sort of supercell. So the cluster is able to coordinate, um, to have a very contractile rear, and to to do to rely more on, the, on its propulsive uh, capacity and its uh, traction-based capacity. And so uh, that was exemplified by these lo local retrograde fluxes of, of myosin we could see on the on the walls of the channels. And so this form of migration as we've shown uh, using our microfluidic devices, it can happen in non-invasive environments. So that would be the lumen of anything like blood or olfactic vessels. And so we think it's very, uh, this mode, this, the discovery of this mode of migration is very important because um, since it doesn't rely on the interaction with the, the extracellular matrix, theoretically it's able to invade um, any type of, of tissue because it doesn't have to express a subset of of receptors to, to be able to, to grasp the matrix that is uh, present in this environment. So in the point of view of the cancer cells, it's a very efficient uh, mode of migration. So with this, I'd like to thank everybody here in the journal lab, in particular, the people that are in red here. So uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to Diane Law. Uh, she is a PhD student in the, the journal lab. Uh, she started this, all this work uh, before I, I, I joined in. Uh, we were also helped by uh, Jui, who uh, has now left uh, the lab. And uh, as I told you, Jean, uh, he's been doing the um, photoactivation studies in the Copé lab. And uh, also Emily, who's recently joined the lab that uh, has helped us a lot in uh, doing the PIV uh, analysis to, to uh, quantify the fluxes that, uh, that we could see. I also would like to thank our collaborators in the pathology department and in the digestive cancer unit for giving us access to to patients, um, <clears throat> our collaborators, Mathieu Piel, Mathieu Copé, and Raphael Boiturier, uh, for their continuous input uh, in, uh, for, the, for our work and um, all our sources of funding and, uh, and you for your attention. So I can take any, any questions. Thanks, Emmanuel. That was really nice stuff. Um, I'll save my own questions for a bit later. I'll go straight to the ones that have been asked from the uh, people first. So um, Oscar Ruiz asks if the, does the light activated row A direction change occur because the opto activation is greater than the original rear? Does the light activated row direction change? So I guess it's, uh, are they changing direction because you've changed the, contractility more than what it is originally, maybe. Yeah, it's kind of, I don't really understand the, so that's kind of the, what we're trying to achieve there <laughs> by um, activating Roy. So it, um, what we think we're doing in this experiment is the, is um, changing the contractility, uh, the, the say, the direct, the, the where the contract, the most contractility is seen. So we switch it from the front, from front to back and then this correlates to a change in direction. So for us, this uh, is a causative, uh, um, causative evidence that, so you can directly link this sort of increased contractility uh, at the rear uh, with the movement. So that's what we're trying to achieve in, in this experiment. So sorry, I don't really understand the, the question. Um, okay, well, if, um... Uh, sorry, Oscar uh, put in the chat, the rear is already activated, then in order to change your direction, you must activate the old front, but the old rear is already activated. Does that help? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. It, I think it's, um, I think it's a very dynamic, so it's a very dynamic system. It's not like once you've set the rear, it's just going to go like that forever. It's, so, I mean, so far, we don't really know what's, what triggers this polarization. We don't know this. Uh, it seems like ROA activation uh, triggers this uh, increase in polarity and then specify which, where is the rear. Uh, so, I mean, we don't know what the trigger is, but it seems, uh, it seems like that, that it doesn't matter. It, it's not because you've activated uh, some cells in the cluster that they're gonna stay activated for uh, forever. It, this is very plastic. So they can change, they can change uh, direction and they probably depending on chemical cues or chemotactic gradients and things like that. All right, great. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, from Jorge Bar Barbazan, um, do cells moving inside 
sorry, do cells inside migrating clusters divide while moving? If yes, does proliferation influence migration speed? So yeah, cells do, uh, especially in the cell lines, not so much in the, in the samples from patients, but uh, the cell lines, they do divide when they're moving. And so we didn't really see, so it depends where proliferation happens. If it's one cell that is uh, included inside this contractile ring, then by the fact that it's dividing, it kind of breaks this contractile ring and then the cluster stops. But if the if proliferation happens in the middle, for example, or at the front, uh, it doesn't seem to have any impact and the cluster keeps on migrating. So it seems that it's only really relevant when it happens where uh, contractility is highest. Thanks. Uh, question from Mankita Jha. Uh, how would active row A and rack look in the tips? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we would like to, to understand this because we can't really uh, manipulate it in the tips. We have difficulties um, putting, um, expressing fluorescent markers and, and so on. So, I mean, since it's, um, in our hands, it seems to behave the same as cell lines. So um, we would think that row A should be uh, stronger at the back, like we see in the cell lines. Great. Um, from Sayali Chaudhari, what is the identity of individual cells in the migrating cell group? Um, are they polarized and epithelial, or are they mesenchymal? So this we didn't really test. Um, so we don't really know. Um, so the way we grow them, they, we, the way we generate clusters. So uh, we try to make them from one cell, but very often it's uh, a couple of cells. So uh, it can very well be uh, a mixture of um, different kind of uh, phenotype and different kind of EMT stages in the clusters. But uh, really we haven't done much on this. Thanks. Uh, Jordi is asking what your thoughts are about the differences between Neurocrest and these amoeboids that you're discussing. <laughs> so saying that one is the like more global retrograde where the cells are moving, but in your case, it's the actin retrograde that's locally retrograde flowing. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, um, for us, it's, um, I mean, as far as I know, uh, in, your, in your model, Adam, you're more in a 2D kind of, uh, system where you have, you have your cells on a, on a fibronectin coated glass surface. Whereas for us, we have a lot of cell-cell interactions. So that's one key difference, I think. And um, we have also have the, this confinement um, parameter. So there's, uh, there's actually plenty of differences, but be really curious to see what happens when you put Neurocrest in our, in our uh, microfluidic devices. <laughs> All right, great. We just have a couple more before we move on to Candice. Um, from George, if I understood correctly, there is no myosin on the glass cluster interface. Any idea why? Uh, there's plenty of myosin at the glass uh, interface. You know, we see plenty of actin, plenty of myosin. Uh, actually, we see uh, a lot of actin. Um, how do you see? Um, um, stress fibers, sorry. Uh, what I meant is that the, the, when we follow the dynamics, we don't see anything, we don't see any patterns. So we don't see any sort of global retrograde flow uh, that would explain the migration. But there's plenty of actin and myosin. Uh, actually, there's probably more myosin uh, at the glass interface than anywhere else. Thanks. Uh, AJ Chitnis asks if there are lamellipodia. Uh, lamellipodia, no, there's no lamellipodia as far as I can tell, um, I mean, at least on the glass. We don't see, uh, we don't see lamellipodia. Great. Um, from Anna Pasapera, is this gradient of contractility dependent on e cadherent junctions? <laughs> um, that's a, also a really good question. Um, so this has been on my list. I've not tried it so far. Um, from what I can tell in the literature, these, the I mean, at least the MTX cell line is uh, richer in n cadherin, so it's probably going to, it might be more reliant on N than E. Um, but nevertheless, cell-cell junction seems to be a, a critical factor 
All right, I think we might have a couple more questions. Um, maybe we can ask afterwards because I want to um, move on to Candace. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thanks, that everyone. was a really great talk. Thanks a lot. Um, so we're really delighted to have for our second speaker today, Candace Tanner. She got her PhD in physics from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She did postdocs at the University of California at Irvine and at Berkeley. Uh, she joined NIH in 2012 as a Stadman investigator, and she's now a senior investigator at the National Cancer Institute. The Tanner Lab focuses on understanding the metastatic traits that allow tumor cells to colonize secondary organs with an interdisciplinary team, including physicists, engineers, and cancer biologists. Um, the lab's current studies are focused on understanding how physical cues from the tissue microenvironment drive organ-specific metastasis. And uh, we're really excited to have her here and go ahead, thanks so much. So thank you to the organizers for in, in, um, including us in this wonderful seminar series and to the virtual audience for um, uh, your participation and looking forward to any questions that you may have. So from the title, you see that we're focused on trying to understand how biophysical cues from the tissue microenvironment uh, may be important in terms of determinants of cancer metastasis. So let's define a few terms. So in this cartoon, tumor cells are shown in blue and metastasis simply describes the process by which these tumor cells are able to leave a primary site enter directly into conduits such as blood vessels or lymphatics, survive within these conduits and then re-emerge to have a secondary lesion at a distant site. Um, from the point of view of the clinical um, aspect, it still is one of the major causes of lethality where as much as 90% of patients will succumb to this disease. So we have quite a great understanding in terms of what genetic and environmental perturbations may drive this transformation from normal cells to malignant cells. But in the last 10 years, it's become much more um, evident that in addition to these genetic and environmental perturbations, that physical properties of the tissue and cells themselves are important in terms of understanding how normal cells progress to malignancy and more importantly, how it progresses to invasion and metastasis. So defining a few of these terms, if we now zoom in on the primary tumor, uh, what others have found is that tumor cells have a different mechanical phenotype to that of normal cells. As these cells proliferate and form these larger clusters, they also expand like different types of um, forces on uh, the matrix environment, exercise matrix here. And in terms of remodeling either to form sort of aligned collagen bundles, if we look at collagen type one as the stromal microenvironment, um, ECM, or they could become more fibrillar. As these cells also migrate along blood vessels or within conduits where the widths of the blood vessels or lymphatics are comparable to the widths of the blood um, the tumor cells, that in itself drives something known as confined migration. And within all of these factors, this has been also important in driving changes in gene expression. Now, bringing this into the context of now into larger scale of at the organ scale, what tumor cells may also have to do is adapt to different mechanical properties in different microenvironments. So now if we use the schematic where we use melanoma, which arises from transformed melanocytes, within a given microenvironment, cells have homotypic interactions with other tumor cells. They have heterotypic interactions with stromal cells, such as fibroblasts and immune cells, matrix components, but on the organ level, you also have differences in mechanical properties. But yet these cells are malleable enough to not ad only adapt to different uh, cell types. When so this example, we show brain as a site of metastasis, but also the brain itself has a different mechanical property. So what I'd like to be able to try to, to emphasize the, the sort of like um, complexity of this problem is the dynamics, as we showed earlier, that uh, the dynamics is important in terms of understanding how these, this interplay between cells and this environment. So on the outer framework here, what we're looking at is cells and tissues having some defined mechanical property, which we'll describe later on as viscoelasticity. 
and yet at different length scales, which is tissues on the order of millimeters, cells on the order of you know, tens of microns, and yet they generate forces that then could remodel matrix components that can be remodeled on the order of tens of microns or hundreds of microns, depending on the types of, of cells that we're looking at. And yet in itself, this outer framework feeds back on itself, but also direct um, biological processes ranging from very fast gene expression changes to slower processes such as cell migration. So it's a fantastic thing to understand how, how do cells at these different length scales and temporal scales regulate changes that then govern cell fate decisions. So how do we do this? The question is that metastasis often occurs in organs that are optically inaccessible for single cell resolution for the length of time to look at these processes. So for the last few years, we've been focusing on, on trying to establish that we can use zebrafish, larval zebrafish, to look at some of these earlier stages of, of um, metastases. So in this movie, I want to orient you to what you're looking at. Uh, this is now the head of a three-day-old fish. So 3DPF is three days post-fertilization. Human cancer cells were introduced by circulation um, one day previously. So this is one day post-injection to finish out the nomenclature. And what you're looking at is a transgenic fish where blood vessels are labeled in gray and the neutrophils, which is one of the um, members of the innate immune system of the zebrafish is present. And what I want you to focus on is that we have a diversity of uh, human cell behavior between this sort of like a zebrafish. One is that we, if we now look at the inset, we see cells that have already extravasated and are surfing a la more like mesenchymal type migration along the um, basement membrane side of the blood vessels. We're also able to catch um, in this upper insert that tumor cells are able to leave the uh, luminal spaces of the blood vessels here and enter directly into the brain parenchyma. And I just want you to kind of pay attention to the um, timing in that it's a relatively fast process. So this gives us a fantastic opportunity to look at different types of cell behavior, cell migration strategies within um, organ specific, albeit here I'm focused on the brain. But the other cool thing about the zebrafish model is that we can follow the same fish with single cell resolution. And now I look, uh, if we look at the inset on the right panel, what you could observe is that we can follow proliferation events where these cells have now divided to form a cluster five days post injection. And then within the diversity of, of behaviors, you could see that some cells remain as single cells for the same time period. So with this in mind, one of the things that I'd like to try to um, talk to you about today is um, within the context of how do tumor cells colonize um, distant organs, but could we then begin to understand if we could predict where the secondary site is and use zebrafish to begin to understand this question. So there's a few more things I need to tell you about metastasis. So seed versus soil hypothesis was first put, put forward by Paget in the late 19th century. And essentially he likened tumor cells to seeds and the organ environment as soils. And if it is that the seeds and soil is compatible, then you would have a successful metastatic lesion. That was first described um, following autopsy for breast cancer patients, but since then it has now been expanded to many other types of tumors, where if we look at prostate cancer as one of an example, some subtypes of prostate cancer preferentially colonize the bone once they've left its primary site. If you look at lung and breast cancer, it's fairly promiscuous in that it can colonize many different organs albeit with different latencies as given by the length of the arrows here where um, brain metastasis in sub subtypes of breast cancer can be seen as much as two decades after. So to go back now in terms of what is known in terms of what uh, intrinsic properties of the gene versus uh, some sort of like defined properties of the soil that facilitate this non-random selectivity. Uh, Masagi and others have shown that uh, certain genes uh, are overexpressed in cells that have a, a preference to go to certain organs like the lung and the brain. Um, others have shown that receptors, like how cells receive cues from its microenvironment, if that's compatible with the chemokines or uh, that are secreted by cells within an organ microenvironment, then that will also have a successful crosstalk for colonization. And uh, more recently, David Leiden's group has shown that uh, cells, tumor cells may not wait uh, in that they can secrete exosomes uh, with key machinery to prime the organ microenvironment to facilitate this non-random selectivity. 
But we are from the context of now interpreting all of what others have shown in terms of what may be important in primary human evolution and invasion, how this may also play a role in non-random organ selectivity. So the first thing we need to do to demonstrate that zebrafish is a model system that would allow us to tackle this question is show that this non-random organ selectivity is conserved in the zebrafish. Even though what defines a zebrafish in terms of a brain and so forth is conserved with that of a mammalian system, there are differences. So we first need to define them. And more importantly, we need to be able to understand what cells see on a length scale that allows them to interpret these cues and therefore define these biophysical cues in vivo. And more importantly, to show that our cells are sensing these cues, we need to identify what types of machinery they're using to sense these cues. And with that information, use some genetic perturbation to see if we could then redirect organ targeting. So let's first start with the first um, point. So in this cartoon, I'm showing you the experimental setup, uh, but first let me tell you something about the cell lines. So we're using 231s that had been derived such that when you inject them into mice, um, the 231 brain targeting preferentially goes to the brain to form lesions, um, albeit some cells are able to colonize different organs as given by the relative sizes of the fonts. And then we're also using an uh, isogenic component of this um, cell line where we are looking at 231 bone marrow targeting, where conversely, they preferentially colonize um, bone marrow when injected into mice. So the experiment goes as follows. We inject directly into the circulation of two-day-old fish, so two days post-fertilization. We simply image and quantify how many cells are present uh, for each fish, either in the brain um, versus that of the cordial vascular plexus, which serves as a, our, um, it's a transient organ that serves as our bone marrow niche at this age. And then we ask the question, do these cells also show preferential colonization uh, in the comparable organs of the zebrafish? So on your left, what you're looking at is the brain of a fish five days post-injection. And what you observe is that for the brain targeting cell, that we have many cells that are present in and outside of the blood vessels. Conversely, when we look at the brains of fish that were injected with the bone marrow homing equivalent, we observe that the brains are largely devoid of cells. And since we can also image the entire fish, what we observed is in the same animal, while you see for the brain targeting that there are some remnants of cells, I could tell you that they're dead and they've never extravasated. Conversely, when we look here uh, for the bone marrow targeting cells, we not only observe extravasation, we also observe proliferation by looking at proliferation markers. So we, um, I'm showing you the data for the 231 series, but this was also confirmed for another isogenic uh, mouse mammary cancer, uh, brain and bone marrow tropic cell line. So with that in mind, now you need to ask like what stage of metastasis are we looking at that's comparable to mammalian systems? So I bring you back to this cartoon that uh, indicates that cancer cells tend to arrest in capillary beds. And this is thought to be one of the first steps uh, to facilitate the cell's ability to enter into a distant organ. So on your right, I'm showing you now these a blow up, uh, well, a magnified image of these human tumor cells. And you can see that tightly that these cells uh, engulfed um, the endothelial as wrapped around these tumor cells. So we wanna be able to, what we believe we're looking at is this sort of like tumor cell endothelial interface. So we have a few things now, um, this is a busy slide, but we have a few assays now to identify what biophysical cues that these cells are seeing, and more importantly, understand what role they may play in facilitating this non-random selectivity. So one is that we understand that cells, again, on the diameter, the length scale of a diameter of a cell can see confined migration within these blood vessels. But more importantly, in terms of how the, the architecture in terms of more chaotic versus ordered may also play a role in terms of why these cells self-select. We also um, uh, use a home-built system of optical tweezers such that we can map 
um, the micro, the tissue micro um, bio, biophysical properties in vivo. And here I'm looking at a cell, a blood cell, where we focus near infrared light such that we could sufficiently move the cell with our near infrared focus light. Um, we just show this that we can use powers that will have sufficient signal to noise ratio without harming the fish, which is important when studying biological assays. Finally, we have the image resolution, temporal resolution to be able to track blood flows within these different organs to understand how the presence of flow may also influence this uh, sort of like um, non-random selectivity. And finally, we use microfluidics for a, a sort of like a gut control because we are cognizant of the fact that we're putting human cancer cells in zebrafish. So these microfluid devices are meant to mimic what types of vessel architectures are seen in vivo. But instead, we put a uniform human exercise matrix protein in here, such that we can then dissect any differences that may occur with human zebrafish stroma versus human-human interactions. So with that in mind, we return to this sort of like canonical version of uh, how cells are thought to leave the primary site to enter into a distant organ. Obviously, cells don't have, I took out here, primary tumor and intravasation because in this system, we will be looking at the latter stages of the metastatic cascade, uh, looking from traveling in the conduits and, and, and further on. So first, let's examine circulatory transit. So the question is that within these brain and bone marrow targeting cells, do they simply migrate differently once you put them within these conduits in vivo? So again, we first want to understand the types of uh, architectures that we're looking at. And from this uh, sort of image, one can appreciate there's a diversity in two things. One is the um, apparent like um, uh, in terms of vessel architecture. But when we quantify the widths of these blood vessels, uh, largely they're roughly about 12 microns. Uh, this here simply gives you the histogram of the distribution of these blood vessels. And suffice to say, they're comparable to been observed and measured for lung capillaries. So I want you to think about the zebrafish at this age as if it's a massive capillary bed. So we are really looking at this sort of circulatory um, um, arrest of tumor cells within a capillary bed. So one of the things, because the fish is growing at the same time that we're doing these types of quantitation, we just have to do a few um, sort of um, image processing simply to remove the underlying um, morphogenesis from that of what the tumor cells are doing in, in vivo. And with that in mind, we then take this uh, processed image to compare cells migrating with in vivo to that of our microfluidic devices, again, to account for any distinctions that may occur between the mismatch of zebrafish stroma versus that of human. So what did we observe? Just to remind you, this is now the microfluid devices compared to in vivo. And if we look at the uh, brain homing cells versus that of the bone marrow targeting cells, what we observe is largely there are no differences between what is observed in vivo versus what's observed in our in vitro memetics. So largely, at least in our system, in these types of well-defined geometries, that the brain, there's no difference in terms of migration speeds in vivo and in vitro. So the question we then ask is if they have similar in terms of their migration, is there then a difference in survival? Meaning that uh, if the cells can get there equally, then if we place them, we force them into the organ, is this then the rate limiting step? And without showing any data, I could tell you that when we injected um, these tumor cells co-injected either into the brain or into the cardiovascular plexus, we saw no difference in their survival within these organs. So uh, in the interest of time, uh, extravasation was sort of seen as a rate limiting step uh, for why we see this non-random selectivity in vivo. So how did we then try to establish this? So going back to this image of the fact that these endothelial cells are wrapped around uh, these tumor cells in vivo, what we observed then is we asked, is it then this interface, is it the same in terms of mechanical properties at the endothelium versus that of the uh, brain versus the cardiovascular plexus? And again, just to remind you that this will influence cell fate decisions. So I wanna play this movie here. Um, because I, I want you to look at it from the perspective of what would 
um, a cell C. So picture that the cell's protrusion, it could be a filopodia, whatever it is, is now interacting with the environment. And at a given temporal scale, this behavior is similar to that, more of a liquid. Whereas if it now interrogates the same material at a different temporal in, um, scale, which as this movie plays, you'll see that the material switches from behaving more like a liquid to behaving more like a solid. And tissue and cells have defined viscoelastic properties that then based on the frequency at which you probe could either be liquid-like or more solid-like, hence the name viscoelastic. And this is important to interrogate at these different frequencies because life occurs at different frequencies. Again, that will govern cell fate decisions starting from the fastest of ion channel gates into slow processes. So what we did is we used our optical tweezer setup to probe at the lens scale at which these cells are interacting to sense these cues. And we chose one micron beads in diameter as shown here in this movie in blue. So what we did is we then uh, apply our uh, near infrared light and we do a frequency sweep where we probe from three Hertz up until 15 kilohertz. And then we're able to then to follow what the viscoelastic behavior is according to this um, wide dynamic range. So when we did this, at both the brain, the interface to so the apical faces of the endothelium for the brain and the cardiovascular plexus, at the age at which we inject these tumor cells, they're largely the same. So at least at the times at which these cells become arrested, the apical surfaces are um, comparable in terms of its mechanical property, where now the y-axis is gonna give you the complex modulus as a function of this frequency sweep that I described. I'm not showing you the data, but as the fish ages, the brain um, becomes two thirds as, as stiff as that of the cardiovascular plexus. So then let's, let's, so if it is that the mechanical properties are comparable at these interfaces at the age at which we see uh, tumor cell arrest, uh, let's go back to this, this sort of like striking thing that one can see by eye in terms of the vessel architecture of the state. So from the images, we simply quantify at least on the diameter of a cell, if the cell would see an environment that's more linear versus that of more chaotic or tortuous, where a more chaotic environment will have values closer to zero, where something more linear, again, on the length scale of the diameter of a cell would be more closer to one. And uh, what we observe is that the architecture within the bone marrow niche environment, which is the cardiovascular plexus, is more chaotic than that of the brain versus that of these intersegmental vessels. And this is just a histogram to show the relative frequencies. And then we ask simply then, uh, is the flow different within these environments due to the differences in the vessel architecture? And suffice to say, what we observed is that the average flow within the brain and the cardiovascular plexus are comparable. Now that doesn't mean that blood flow is not important in metastasis. It's just in this system right now, we can't uh, tune one um, difference in terms of its blood flow in one organ versus the other. So then we simply ask just the differences in the, in the mechanical properties, is that in the physical architectures, is that sufficient to drive this non-random selectivity? And let me explain this graph. On the y-axis, how these values were calculated is that we took the number of cells that actually passed through, so migrated within the organ. We simply quantified how many cells um, became stuck or occluded after 12 hours to calculate this relative ratio. And as a function of the x-axis, what you see now are the two different uh, isogenic clones, so brain targeted and bone marrow targeted for 231s versus the 41s and then beads. And let me explain what I mean by beads, because we want to understand if there is a very specific receptor that then biases one versus the other. And our beads here should not have any specific receptor that will do so. So that's one of our controls. And what we observed is that independently of, of what cells or, or what type or the beads, then we observe that most of these tend to get stuck in the more chaotic cardiovascular plexus. So the question you should ask at this stage is, but you observe this non-random selectivity. So it goes back to this framework 
that yes, the mechanical properties are important, but one is that do the cells have equally the cellular machinery to sense these cues? So what we did is we then did proteomic analysis to understand what may be different uh, between these uh, brain homin cells versus that of the bone marrow homin cells. And in this audience, it's no surprise um, that many proteins associated with how cells talk to the extracellular matrix protein um, environment, how um, cells attach via focal adhesions. So uh, integrin beta-1 was overexpressed in bone marrow homin cells versus that of the brain targeting cells. Um, and um, un unconventional myosin 1B uh, was shown to be converse where it was overexpressed in the brain targeting cells compared to that of the bone marrow targeting cells. So I'm just gonna focus on this one in the interest of time today. So where is myosin 1B located with respect to how cells may sense this environment. So on the left micrograph, you're looking at a brain homin cell versus that of a bone marrow homin cell. And you observe that there are these protrusions. We have not categorized them yet as philopodia. We still have to do some more tests, but let's call them protrusions. And we notice that myosin 1B is localized to these protrusions compared to the bone marrow homin cell, which really doesn't have those protrusions and simply doesn't have a well-defined pattern of myosin 1B. So when we silence myosin 1B, let's see what happened. We observe that cells lose the ability to colonize. They, they go to the brain, from the brain to go to cardiovascular plexus. So let me explain this um, slide. Starting from left to right, what we did is we quantified how many tumor cells are present in this bone marrow niche. We do not disregard our fish that show colonization in both organs simply because we can observe this. And then finally, we compare that to fish that only show extravasation in the brain. So the uh, pie charts are as follows. This is for the brain targeting cell. And what you observe is this relative loss of uh, this green, where now we have an increase where these brain targeting cells preferentially go to the cardiovascular plexus upon silencing. And in terms of the bone marrow targeting, we also have an increase. Now, just as a gut check to make sure that what we found is not a zebrafish specific um, situation, we then took a parental cell where we silenced uh, myosin 1B and injected them via uh, intracardiac injection into mice. And we also observed that there's a loss in brain um, colonization and, and metastasis um, upon myosin 1B silencing. So, so far, um, what I've shown you is that the uh, zebrafish has um, sufficient conservation that we could use this as a potential model to look at um, what drives this non-random selectivity in, in vivo. And more importantly, that architecture may also play a role in terms of why these cells um, select and, and in terms of driving this sort of siloing. And, and for us, we were excited because of uh, the ident using this preclinical model um, that's unconventional, that we can be able to establish new um, proteins associated with uh, brain tropism. And, and in our hands, at least we could shift some sites just by genetic perturbation. So I end with what I started with. What um, has been shown to be important in terms of what may drive the seed versus soil hypothesis? But there's a, a lesser known and um, uh, I would say hypothesis that was put forward by James Ewan in terms of there's a mechanical hypothesis where the vascular um, architecture may play a role in this non-random selectivity. And we believe that zebrafish could allow us to test this more in greater detail. And with that, I'd like to thank the people who did the work. I think along the way I placed the uh, names, but just to make sure I thank them correctly. Colin Paul, who's now gone on to have his own job. He did the bulk of the uh, data that I showed today. Uh, Norbert also did some of the work that I also showed. And in the interest of time, obviously I couldn't show all of the other works by the other people, but I still wanna acknowledge and thank them. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Great, thank you so much. Um... I have a couple questions, but I'll hold off to the end. Um, from Guglia uh, wants to know, how did you inject the human cancer cells into the zebrafish? Do you inject them in the yolk or straight into the blood flow? So we go directly into the blood flow. That's an excellent question. So um, uh, we inject in the caudal vein. So if you read the literature, sometimes you see that people put into the duct of cuvee 
We found that when we've done the injections uh, that way, because these cells are relatively large, a lot of them get occluded in the heart and form like a primary tumor, um, kind of like mimic. So when we inject directly into the caudal vein, we have a, a greater success in, in dissemination within the blood vessels. So that's a good point. Thanks. Uh, I've got a question from Goldman. It says, uh, with optical tweezers, you observe no frequency differences in the complex modulus, but what about probing creep behavior? Was the tan delta different? So that's a great point. So he is right. There is a difference in the, in the creep behavior of the tan delta that I did not show at higher frequencies. So frequencies above uh, 400 hertz, we see a slight divergence between the um, quote unquote brain tissue. Well, I would say apical surface of the endothelium of the brain versus that, but not significantly when we did by statistical analysis. And certainly not at the frequencies at which cells would be probing that would be important for cell migration. So that's a good point. Uh, cool, thanks. I was just um, curious about, I guess specifically if you think your model would be uh, amenable to injecting tumor clusters and then just more generally, um, I'm always curious about this, uh, you know, the opinion of people who are actually working on cancer metastasis about this whole issue about single cell versus clusters of cells, because, um, yeah. you know, obviously there's, there's some controversy in the literature. And, and so I was curious to get your perspective on that. I, I am, I'm of the um, frame of mind that tumor cells can use single cells or clusters. I, I don't think there's, there's one versus the other. I, I truly think that whatever is beneficial or convenient for the cell, that's what it's going to do, unfortunately, for tumor cells. Now, um, I do believe that um, Andy Ewald's work especially has shown that clusters of cells have been much more efficient in metastatic seeding. Um, so we can test that in our system. For us, we were trying to focus on really understanding how these tumor cells interplay with these uh, apical endothelial interfaces. But I, I, it's, it is amenable, um, one can pre-cluster, but I think we also have the slight disadvantage in the zebrafish system at the age at which we injected, now one can inject at a, a later stage, that these clusters will be relatively large with respect to the widths of the blood vessels, right? So um, I think that one would have to modify to maybe inject at four days post-fertilization or older to be able to have the quote unquote clusters comparable to what you would see in a mammalian system. Right, right. So you'd have to optimize, but you could do that in your system. Right. Thank you. We've got a question from um, Alex Ruska, who Wait. asked what the role could be for myosin 1B in brain versus bone targeting. So, he, he, so Alex, that's a good point. And actually, Alex used to be, uh, he was a graduate student intern. So hi, Alex, how are you doing? <laughs> right. um, so the, the thing that we need to understand is the downstream signaling. So what I did not show you is that we also perform proteomic analysis to see what is perturbed upon silence in a myosin 1B, and then try to understand what may be the mechanism, mechanism that may be important for, for um, brain metastasis. So Alex, all I could tell you that we're trying to go through the network and, and see why this in particular. What has been shown in literature is that myosin 1B is, is expressed in neurons and so forth, and also important for neuronal migration. So I don't know if it's, it's a case of cancer cells hijacking something that say like a, a normal stromal cell would do, that I can't tell you. Um, Alex says, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, and then we have a question from Jonah Kaiser. Uh, says that was enthralling. I agree. Uh, thanks. In zebrafish, yeah, how I'll long? Tell that, you know, I'll tell tell that to the people who do the work. I'm um, I'm kind of useless. I afraid I'm afraid right now. <laughs> You're just the messenger, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> the messenger exactly. Um, so Jonah says, in zebrafish, how long can you follow metastatic growth post extravasation? 
So that's a good point. And I'm glad that he brought that up. Um, so the fish that we have been using for this system are immune competent in that we have both the innate, so neutrophils and macrophages that are present at the time that we do the injection, but the adaptive immunity starts come up at nine days old. And uh, we have a complementary study where we injected uh, human macrophages to understand how long would cells survive within this environment and um, they, they they'll survive for two weeks but they will two weeks post injection but they will rapidly be cleared uh, once the uh, innate immunity meaning t cells and so forth are, are fully um, emergent in your zebra fish having said that um uh, Ze uh zealand and patricia who i hope i pointed out in the um image or zoom image is that uh, now they are looking at immune compromised fish um, such that we could be able to do the sort of like xenograft um, experiments that have others have done in mice. So that's a, that's a good point. Okay, great. Um, I think that is um, all we've got for questions. So we really, really appreciate both of our speakers today, Emmanuel and Candice. Um, I just want to remind everyone that next week is our last cell migration seminar of 2020. Um, it's been a garbage year and this has been uh, a light within, you know, a garbage year. So uh, we hope that you'll come and um, join us for <laughs> for that sort of uh, wrap up. Um, so it's that garbage year. <laughs> <laughs> it's been something. Um, so thanks again to both of you, and um, we will see everybody next week.